A lot of people may think that I'm crazy for living here in a yurt with my wife and children. They say things like, you live in a shack and when are you going to get a real house? But you know what I think is crazy? I think it's crazy to buy a big old house with a big old mortgage that it takes you 30 years to pay off. And all during that time, spending countless hours away from your family, sacrificing time with your loved ones, as well as sacrificing your own dreams, goals, and desires. All for what? Mostly material things. Working to pay off debt for material things. How sad is that? But you know what? Our country and the world, in fact, needs to reevaluate our morals and priorities. Because yes, we have a lot of material things. Yes, we do, especially here in countries like the United States. But our family lives, our interpersonal relationships, and even our personal fulfillment are not in good shape at all. My good friend and fellow homesteader, Justin Rhodes, said this. We had in our mind to just be together as a family. Even during our hard times, and even where I was having to consider like a real job, we didn't want to be separated. And if that meant we had to jump in dumpsters and grow our own food and trade work for rent uh, and do all these different kinds of creative things, then that's what we were going to do. I'd rather us be together as a family and live in a cardboard box than me to go off and be away from them all day. And I totally agree with him. I would rather live in a tent, an igloo, a tiny house, whatever our ancestors used to live in way back in the day, all the different things that they lived in. I'd rather do that and have the family life that I wanted to live and live by the morals and priorities and principles that I would want to live by than to sacrifice all of that for material things or a traditional house. Now, I'm not saying that if you have a big house or a traditional house, or even if you have a really big house, that you can't have a good family life. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying that each of us in our own individual situations and circumstances need to evaluate and live our lives according to the priorities that we want to live. To not let the media, the commercials, the TV, any of that dictate what it is that brings us happiness and fulfillment because it's not those things it's not which is why years ago my wife and I we decided to sell it all to sell our traditional house and many other things that we own to leave that to come out here to the country to homestead and to live in a yurt so that way we could live the life that we want to live and for those of you who have never heard of a yurt nor know where they come from, they come from the Mongolians who have for many, many years lived in yurts, or gurs as they call them. Recently, my good friend Hilda from the Wise Traditions podcast visited us here on our homestead. And one of the things that we talked about was her unique experience here recently with yurts. <laughs> Hi, beautiful. Hello, how are you? Are you? You. you too, it's been so long. I know, it feels like forever. It it's just a couple of years. I know, but then everywhere we've gone, and you were supposed to be there, like you were there, or we were there, or something. In the so. time in between, you've had a baby, and I've posted like 70 more podcasts. That's, That's how long crazy. it's been. Yeah, <laughs> 70, wow. <laughs> you have to like 10 million downloads yes. tonight. That's you fantastic. Guys. It's so special, and it kind of blows my mind. It's like yeah. with your YouTube milestones, it's like, yes. what is happening? Yes, uh, you know, it is. It's really out of our control. All we're doing is sharing our heart, mm -hmm. putting stuff out there, and if it resonates with people, it will grow. It's exactly right. So, yep. I'm so thankful. Cool. And have I'm fun really doing it, right? Yeah, I'm having the time of my life. I wouldn't know you guys are around exactly, for that. Exactly. So, isn't that kind of funny? It oh. is. Yeah, I love so. your hat. Thank you. And I showed him my horse boots. Yeah. <laughs> They're from Mongolia. That's what I figured. And That's this so is from cool. Mongolia too. I'm kind of a Mongolia girl now. <laughs> so I'm here with my good friend Hilda. We hadn't seen each other in such a long time. I know. But it's so good to see you again. I'm so glad to be back. I think this is like your second time here. Yeah. Here. That is great. So one of the things I must admit, I was kind of jealous. Pretty jealous. <laughs> <laughs> when you got to go to Mongolia 
to see an actual year to girl. I was like, what? But I was so happy for you. <laughs> I was also like, what? Like, I can't believe it. Basically, a friend of mine, Mary Ruddick, who's known as the Sherlock Holmes of Health, invited me to go to Mongolia. And believe it or not, Mike, the first thing I told her was no. Oh, really? Yes, I said no. I can't even believe I turned her down, but it's because I was going to go to the Weston A. Price Foundation Conference. And then... That's right, because I was going to plan to see you there. Yes, yes. But then I was like, wait a minute. Conference with people that I love, mm -hmm. wonderful connections, versus a place I've never been before. I literally thought if I go to Mongolia, it's going to be like, psh, like overwhelmingly magnificent, and I'm going to feel this big, and I think that's going to be better for me. So I checked in with Sally and everybody. They said, go with our blessings, and so then off I went. Wow. I don't blame you. I would have went too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I went too, because I was like, the conference, I can go to again, and I will, but this is... Just a once in a lifetime opportunity. So tell tell me about it. What was it like? How long did it take to get there? What was it like when you got there? Well, it took forever to get there is what it felt like. I felt like I might as well have been in a horse and buggy. You oh, know? Man. Hours and hours and hours and hours, of course, in a plane. How many but, planes did you have to get on to get there? I mean, at least three or four because oh, I flew from the U.S. to Turkey, from Turkey to Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia, and then from Ulaanbaatar to the western region of Mongolia, and then we took like this van for hours and hours. It was completely off-grid. This wow. is nothing compared to over there. Wow. <laughs> Wow, so they like are out there in the middle of nowhere? Yes, Mongolia is one of the most sparsely populated countries in the world, meaning hardly anybody's there. Like 80% of the population is in the capital city of Ulaanbaatar. So once you get rolling outside that city, you see nothing. I mean, talking not even roads, wow. not lampposts, nothing, nothing, nothing. That sounds cool. <laughs> I know, it really was cool. And another cool thing is, and I have to bring this up just now because you've been so hospitable to me, is Hospitality is the hallmark of the Mongolian people. Mm. Get this, they live in yurts like this and they prepare food and even if they travel or go somewhere, any stranger can stop in their gur or their yurt any time to eat food wow. and spend the night because they know how hard it is wow. to travel and face the weather and all the ravages of this very sparse, difficult, arid land. Wow, yeah. wow. What was some neat food that you ate? Well, interestingly, and people might like this, they eat very keto. <laughs> like all it was, was animal products because that's all they have. Hardly anything grows there. And maybe I was there in a harsher time of year, I don't know, but honestly, it's mostly animals. So you get meat, you have fat, and you have animal products like the milk or cheese curds or cheese, and that was all we ate. And I was definitely in ketosis, not that I <laughs> follow these things very much, but I was like, I feel really good right now. Right. And get this, we'd be sitting at a meal. First of all, when they serve the meat, they will carve it off the bone right in front of you. Mm -hmm. The men do the carving. The women cook it, but then the men carve it up. And then they would open up a goat's head and give you the brains and open up the bones and give you the marrow. And it was like wow. every bit of the animal was honored. I know I was That's like, cool. wow, I've heard about nose to tail eating. I feel like I eat nose to tail, but this was the real deal. That's a whole nother level of exactly, nose to tail. Exactly, wow. exactly. <laughs> We're in this lovely gur in Mongolia in a southern province not far from China. And we're enjoying a lovely lunch of some of their traditional foods, including mutton with plenty of fat, fresh butter with that bright yellow color that indicates how full of wonderful nutrients it is. And why don't you tell them the rest? Ah, these are wonderful cheese curds, one of my new favorite snacks. And this is a new item. So this is the first time today that we've had it. It's a dairy item. It's a type of soft cheese, but different than anything else that I've had before. And this is one of my favorite uh, kinds of cheese items. Uh, we really don't have an equivalent uh, where we're from. And then one thing they serve at every meal and have night and day, it seems, is <laughs> the milk tea made from the tea and the milk because I have nothing extra <laughs> to add for that. But you can also, of course, add butter and clotted cream to make it even more rich and delicious. And that is pretty normal for them to do. So you, you do typically put at least the butter, if not the butter and the clotted cream. We love it here, as you can tell. We've We're really moving become, in. I've become assimilated. <laughs> <laughs> So I read that they travel with the animals. Is that true? 
Uh, yes, they are a nomadic herding kind of people, absolutely. Um, and so that was funny too. With my van driver, he was tracking, trying to take me to a home where they were going to receive um, me and my guide, and he couldn't find them. And the question is, like, how do you ask for directions when mm. people are always moving? Like, literally, I was like, wow. we have no idea where we are. <laughs> but he could gauge, literally, no GPS or anything. He could gauge by the mountains, by the setting of the sun, I guess, more or less the wow. direction to go in. We'd run into one person on a motorcycle going that way with his camels, and he would stop him, and they would start talking, and we, we figured it out. We got there. Uh, but yeah, the main animals that they do herd are camels and yak. Okay. And there were also horses and sheep and goats. Yep. Wow. Yep. How was the yak? What does it taste like? I mostly had its butter. Okay. Um, they use the yak butter in their tea, their milk tea, and also for making curds and cheeses. Um, I did eat I don't know if I should say this on camera, but I did eat horse, actually. Wow. Some wow. people are maybe against that, but it's an animal and it's what they have. Yeah. You kind of can't fault people and it makes full sense that you're going to avail yourself of what you've got. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's almost luxurious to be vegetarian or vegan because in most parts of the world, the land isn't arable. You can't grow anything. Yeah. So what do you have but animals? So you have their products and you have the animals themselves. And again, if nothing is wasted, I think it is a way to honor the animal too. Now tell me, what was it like being in one of their yurts, their girls? What was uh, it like? <laughs> well, first, thank you to you because you and Lacey offered your hospitality to me here and you were kind of my initiation to this kind of living. Okay. <laughs> um, but there, it's not a rare thing. A lot of people, most of the population lives in these girls. They call them wow. girls or yurts, yes. Only they're smaller and almost dedicated to each way of living. So one room would be the kitchen area. They'd have a little table, they would have the wood-burning stove in the middle, and the little cabinets where they would store their food. There were no refrigerators, they would just keep the stuff in the cabinets because it's cold enough, do you see? So we would eat in those spaces, and then the other girls, they would have several, would be for accommodations, for sleeping. And okay. that's all, you sleep and you eat, that's about it. And then you're doing your chores outside and stuff. So it was designed like this, but much smaller, I would say probably a a fourth of the size, and the wood-burning stove um, was mostly fueled by yak manure mm. or coal. And I actually preferred the manure for fuel because the coal, I don't know what the mining is like there, but I felt like it would off-gas some stuff that would sometimes make me wake up a little bit or give me tinnitus. And my friend who I was traveling with, Mary, said that's probably some of the chemicals that are found along with the coal. Wow. So, But they were so so gracious as hosts. They would get up in the middle of the night to stoke the fire so we wouldn't get too cold. So you slept in one. I did. Oh, was that? a bunch of them. <laughs> a bunch of them. Well, my friend Mary, she's so sweet. And I know she won't mind if I imitate her, but I felt like sometimes I was traveling with this Disney princess. She's so beautiful. She's tall. You know, she's just graceful. And, and people would knock on the yurt door you know and she'd be like come in and I was like who is this person but she's genuine and beautiful but what I want to get at is Mary would say Hilda I could sleep in this yurt all the time and I didn't quite feel that way <laughs> this is the yurt that we spent the night in there was a wood burning stove that they actually filled with coal even in the middle of the night to keep us warm because otherwise it would have been quite inhospitable because these are simply um I don't know, I, I guess I would say wool and blanket coverings around the tent. They are natural fabrics, but uh, this is not where they would stay all winter long. They would stay, they consider this like the summer place. Um, in the winter, they move up, up in the mountains where there's less wind. Uh, but regardless, they have the stove to keep us warm. And to be honest with you, I woke up in the middle of the night and I think it's because uh, coal, which they were using to keep us warm, actually can release some toxins that um, can irritate the body, I guess I would say. But I'm um, hoping tonight will be a little bit better than last night for me. Although my roommate slept all night long. She had no trouble with all that, so that was interesting. But I'm grateful for the hospitality, really, that they continue to show us here. It's been phenomenal. <laughs> I liked it, but let me be honest. We had to sleep with all of our clothes on, for mm -hmm. one thing, because it's cold. So yes, there were a few blankets, but you would be you would put things on to go to sleep, let's mm -hmm. just say. So that was a little uncomfortable, plus you're kind of in a cot, plus you're far from home. But the thing I did like, like I said, was the fact that they would do so much to make us feel comfortable, and just like with your yurt, 
there was a way to see the sky, mm. you know, in the middle of the night. So you'd have the, the pipe of the wood burning stove in the middle of the ceiling, but also you would see, you know, it, the sky framing it and the stars. Oh. So it was glorious. I mean, I saw more stars in that sky than wow. I've seen in a long time. Of course, you know, I live in the city, wow. um, but I found it amazing. The food, the people. And I want to tell you about one special experience I had too. So we stayed with this family, Oscar's family, um, very off grid in Western Mongolia. And he is an eagle hunter. Do you know what they are? No, I do not. Well, it sounds like they hunt eagles, but no. What they do is they train eagles to help them get prey, hmm. like foxes and rabbits and wolves. So what they do is they get the little eaglet from the nest when it's under a year old. Okay. And can you imagine even doing that? Like they wow. climb up to the highest crags wow. of mountains and they get this little eaglet, they bring it down. Then like a falcon training, I guess, they would put a little hood on it, um, teach it to respond to their voice, have meat to attract it, till they get to the point where they can let it free, set it free and have it bring back a rabbit or a fox or what have you for pelt and for meat. Wow, so it's I like know. a falconer. Yes, wow. yes. And so there I was with some eagle hunters. I mean, I just can't believe it when I stop and think about it because I didn't know what it was till I got there. And they were like, hey, do you want to, you know, hold the eagle? I was like, sure. These things weigh like 40 pounds. Wow. Perched on your arm, you have to be the fit wow. farmer or holistic Hilda <laughs> to be able go. to do this. Wow. I do. I have some muscles here. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> but it was something, and then one of my favorite moments, apart from watching them train the eagles, which we got to observe, um, Oscar has two daughters that he's training to be eagle hunters. Oh, wow, that's so, neat. We got on our horses, and the girls, these eagles are so heavy, like I said, they would have a, a stick propping up their arm so that they could hold the eagle the whole time they were going oh, out to where man. we were gonna train it. I know. Then they trained it, they were calling it, and it was flying down, and they would give it some meat, and it was beautiful. But then Oscar was like, do you want to see our winter home? A very modest, you know, kind of concrete building, you know, made with some rocks just a few miles from where they lived. But we said, absolutely, we want to see it. So we got on these horses and we traveled behind him to see their winter home. And as we were on the horses, he started singing. And it was so beautiful, Mike, because he wasn't singing to impress us. He wasn't singing... Uh, for any other reason than just out of pure joy. Wow. Like there was no doubt in my mind, this man is living his healthiest, best life. He doesn't have TV. He doesn't have a nine to five job. He's not making a million dollars, but he is wealthy beyond measure. Wow, that sounds beautiful. That sounds really beautiful. It was beautiful. And so when I take these travels around the world, I'm reminded of what really matters. And I do film a little, I take some pictures, but I also just try to experience the moment. Yeah. You know how it is? Because yeah. you've got your channel and you could film a lot of stuff and sometimes you're like, you know, this is just for us, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I got on this camel, by the way, they have two humped camels in Mongolia. And um, I got on this camel and I was like, okay, I'm just gonna remember this moment. I'm just gonna hold on to this moment. So I grabbed the camel's fur, they have a lot of fur. And they're very tall, very big animals, not easy to get on or to dismount from, I learned. Um, but I just grabbed onto it and I was just like, okay, hold on to this moment. The, the sound of their hooves on the ground and the guide with me, he was in his traditional like silk robe. They wear these like beautiful, they're both utilitarian and beautiful robes and clothing that keeps them warm, but also has craftsmanship to it, I would uh -huh. say. So he was wearing this blue silk robe that underneath was probably lined with animal fur. And you know, there we were riding along together in the middle of the Gobi Desert. Yeah, that's where I was actually at this time. And I was like, oh my gosh, what is life? This is beautiful. And I just think whether you're here in North Carolina, whether I'm home in DC, I'm just convinced that there's beauty at every turn if we just take a moment to experience it. Yeah, that's right. That's powerful.
thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything uh, else on the journey that <laughs> these are some oh, powerful things? I know, <laughs> I know. Well, now, when they they how, uh, families live together, big families. Yeah, yeah. That's the next story I'm going to tell you. So I met this 88 year old grandmother, and I would tell you her name if I could remember how to pronounce it. You know, th these are Kazakh nomadic people in Mongolia. So I. I can't tell you off the top of my head what her name was, but she was beautiful and she had some boots that I think inspired my own. I bought some horsehair boots <laughs> because you need the fur of the animals to stay warm over there, okay? This is cashmere. I got into it. I got into it. I was like, why not use the real deal? But anyway, she said to me, well, we smiled at each other and through a translator, she said, you know, she liked my vibe, in other words. And I said, can I ask you some questions? And she said, yes. So through a translator, I asked her like, what's your life like? She said, you know, I have six children and now they're grown. I think a couple still live with her and they help her and her husband with the herds that they have. Mm. And then she said she had like 40 grandchildren. Wow. I know. <laughs> and when I kind of asked her, which you want to ask people as they get older, like, what's your secret? What do you think is the secret for living? She said, family is everything. Mm. And it was that. so That's beautiful. Great. And I was so moved. And so just that reminded me, like, you know, hold your family tight. Yes. You know, you might think you're working really hard for them. That's wonderful. But you don't want to get to the end of your life and think, why didn't I spend more time with them? You know, exactly. so cherish them while you can. I'm just here with Hezekiah, Hezekiah. So it's kind of all in my mind, but these beautiful moments, and I know you do this, of holding him, of cherishing him, looking at his cute little lips, his cute little nose, <laughs> all the things. But anyway, so she was obviously convinced that family is everything. And then I asked her another interesting question. I said, when you were sick, when you were little, what did your parents do to make you feel better? Because I'm curious, is she going to mention like medicinal teas or things in the area? She said, we had no concept of being sick. Wow. Exactly. I was like, what? Wow. And she is not the first person on my travels to tell me that. Wow. Well, she was like, we didn't even know what it was. Wow. They didn't know. So she didn't get sick. So her parents didn't ever do anything. So the Amazing. other person who said this on my travels was a Maasai elder. And he said, if we ever felt a shiver, we would drink milk from the cow and he demonstrated drinking it like this from the teat, you know, but he said, we really didn't get sick. We were always healthy. He's like, but now they tell me my grandchildren need to wear jackets because cold is coming. He said, we didn't wear jackets. You know, they were just hardy. Mm -hmm. And this is what I sense to the Mongolian people. Those who are sticking to their traditional kind of ketogenic diet of, you know, fat and meat and every bit of the animal and primarily that are hale and hearty. There are a reason the Mongolians conquered a lot of the, they had these expansive moments in their history. Mm -hmm. They conquered a lot of the world, I think because they had this strength and resilience. And those that depart from that and start modernizing and having the seed oils and the flowers, it's just like what Dr. Price would say, you know, the displacing foods of modern commerce are going to feel and experience the corresponding decline in health. And it sometimes starts with the teeth, it sometimes starts with the joints, but whatever it is, it doesn't have to be mm. a matter of fact. That's why I love exploring ancestral traditions around the world. That is fantastic. It's so fantastic to know that fellow yurt dwellers, miles, miles, yes. miles, miles away, that I've kind of on the same wavelength is why, this is why we moved to living in a yurt, as many people think that it's crazy, it was because of family. Yeah. Wanted a different life for my family and to spend time with my family as we grow together. Yes, we're so compartmentalized and there's something really beautiful about being together. You know, I got to go to Alaska actually last July. I feel so exotic right now, but it's just it's our like world traveling here. <laughs> it's like a wave the world is taking me on. I'm like, okay, here I go, Kawabunga dude, you know, I'm on top of the wave. Um but so in Alaska I talked to an indigenous, indigenous Inuit person of what tribe, I can't remember off the top of my head, but he was telling me a little bit about their culture and their traditions, and he was uh, showing me, it was a part of a museum and cultural heritage space. He said, you know, we used to live in these homes, and they were like yurts actually, but longer. They were community homes, he said, that could accommodate like 300 people in the community. Wow. He said, we lived in these until the government came around and started helping us, is what he said. Mm. And I was like, hmm. <laughs> Wow. And that's when they started dividing up and living in single family homes and it probably began the dismantling of their tribal identity, I would wow, say. Wow, that's sad. I know. So sad. I know. But so I'm grateful for the experience that I have and those who are willing to share them. That's what I love. As you know, the podcast that I host is called Wise Traditions and we're celebrating like all these millions of downloads. So thank you for your support of that. But I want to say, these aren't my traditions. 
They're not Sally Fallon Morell's traditions. They're not your traditions. They belong to the world. They're kind of gifts from God that we can take on and incorporate into our lives, even in our modern day. This is why I get the sun every morning and I eat the most simple, nutrient-dense food I can because I know that these are traditions that are going to help me live my healthiest and heartiest life. That's fantastic. And I love all the principles that Weston A. Price and Wise Traditions you all promote. But one I wish you would promote more is the one you just talked about, family. I'd love to hear that one. Ah, I'll see what I can do about that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think it started out as uh, this foundation that Sally established in his name mostly based on dietary principles, but they recognize that some of these elements that we can't quite quantify make a real difference in health and healing, for yes, sure. I would agree with that. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. My pleasure. <laughs> I really enjoyed hearing Hilda's Mongolian adventure story and how she got to spend time with the OGs of your dwelling. And I must admit, my favorite part was hearing about her listening to the man singing. And that just, to me, that demonstrates how happy he is with the way that he lives. And everything with the Mongolians and yurt dwelling, it brings to mind the story of the Rechabites in the Bible. How they were nomadic, tent dwelling people, and they follow that way of life by honoring the direction of their forefather, Jonadab, who led them in that lifestyle because he saw a lot of the evils and things going on with the people around him. So he directed his family to live that life so that way they could live a simpler, happier life without all those things that the people were getting involved in. And sometimes we have to do that. Sometimes we have to be willing to make decisions that may seem radical to others to live a happier life and a one that we can f find to be more fulfilling. What? Did I make you mad? Huh? Did I make you mad? Hey. Are you getting fussy? Oh, here you go. Come, Come here, baby. It's that time, <laughs> nursing time, and pretty much sleepy time, too. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we are in the process of planning out our second yurt. Yes, a number of months ago, we bought an additional yurt, and right now we're trying to work out how we want to do the floor plan. Mike and I are pretty visual people, so we like to make a layout of where everything is going to go. And we don't know exacts yet. We just have been playing around with some layouts. But we do know that this yurt is going to be kitchen, dining, and living area. And this current yurt that we're in is just going to be for bedrooms. And we actually had no idea that this is a similar setup to the Mongolians prior to hearing Hilda's story. But it's so neat to know that we're on the same wavelength as people who have done it for hundreds and thousands of years. That we have one yurt as a bedroom area and then one for cooking and eating and, and things like that. Really neat. Really neat to know that. And for those of you who are looking to follow Hilda, just thought that she's really neat because she is. You can follow her on her YouTube channel, Holistic Hilda, but you can also follow her in her podcast that our family just absolutely loves to hear on wise traditions. But uh, we got some more work to do in figuring all this out before we can start living like the Mongolians.